Good day, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Manufacturing Think Tank. I'm Cliff Waldman. I'm the host of this show, one of many on Manufacturing Talk Radio. We have a live event, a strike of great consequence going on with the United Auto Workers. Many issues that are going to affect many Americans even beyond the auto industry. And for that reason, we're covering it with one of the best in, in the business. Patrick Anderson, Patrick, thank you for joining us. His firm has been doing the work that the media has been using to really get uh, an understanding of the um, of the strike and its implications and its, its short term implications for the economy and what it really means. We are the picket lines are live. We're going to talk to uh, the Patrick Anderson today and really get as much insight for our audiences as we can. And again. If you missed last week's episode, you, you you may not remember that I have no problem reading the um, the bios of my guests. I can't even pretend to start uh, memorizing them, and they all deserve you know uh, to be read. Mr. Patrick Anderson founded the Anderson Economic Group in 1996, and he currently serves as the company's principal and CEO. Anderson Economic Group is one of the most recognized boutique consulting firms in the United States and, is, and has been a consultant for many states such as Michigan, Kentucky, North Carolina, Wisconsin and Ohio, the province of Ontario, and, and many manufacturers that include General Motors, Ford, Daimler Chrysler, Honda. So, so many of our audience probably know Patrick uh, very well. And retailers such as Major, Kmart, telecommunications companies such as SBC C and AT&T, utilities like ITC, University of Michigan, the University of Chicago, and other colleges and universities, and franchisees of Anheuser-Busch, Molson, Coors, Miller, Harley-Davidson, Mercedes-Benz, Suzuki, Cadillac, Chevrolet, Ford, Lincoln, and Avis products. He is a known and very respected consultant to a wide range of, of industry players. He's also a prolific writer. He's published over 100 articles, including the Economics of Business Valuation uh, from Stanford University Press. Five of his articles, Pocketbook Issues in the Presidency, The Value of Private Businesses in the United States, Policy Uncertainty and Persistent Unemployment, Firm Strategy and Business Location Decisions, Comparing Modern and Traditional Methods, and Blue Smoke and Sears, Measuring Latent Demand for Cannabis Products in a Partially Criminalized Market, have earned awards for outstanding writing from the National Association of Business Economics. NABE is where I really you know, know Patrick from. He's taken a leading role in several major public policy initiatives in his home state. He was the author of the 1992 Term Limit Amendment to the Michigan Constitution and the 2006 initiated law that repealed the state's four decade old single business tax. His firm's work resulted in a wage increase for home health workers in 2006, the creation of a Michigan um, earned income tax credit in 2008 and the repeal of the item pricing law in 2011. Before founding the Anderson Economic Group, Mr. Anderson was the deputy budget director for the state of Michigan under Gov Governor John Engler and chief of staff for the Michigan Department of State. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan, where he earned a Master of Public Policy degree and a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science. He is a member of the National Association of Business Economics and the National Association of Forensic Economists. The Michigan T Chamber of Commerce awarded Mr. Anderson its 2006 Leadership Michigan Distinguished Alumni Award for his civic and professional accomplishments. The University of Michigan, the Ford School of Public Policy, awarded him its Neil Stabler Award for civic participation in 2014. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. I, I think that, that was a very nice one. Uh, yes, it should have been a little more brief for now, but, it was, but I loved we, hearing it. We want to um, explore, obviously, it's a very live story, but we, we want to, you know, put some parameters on it. We, we want to explore it from its short term and its long term um, angles. So obviously, the supply of labor and the demand for labor are, are you know, because the, the wages and benefits are such a part of the story, we want to explore the supply and demand for labor. So I'm going to first ask you, 
have technology, have things like a lot of things that's happened to manufacturing in the past decade, two decades, have technology, lean production processes, and automation, all those things, have they conspired to make the labor component of auto production, auto production, more expendable? I don't think it is. It has become expendable. I don't think it ever was. So I wouldn't say yes, that it was more expendable. What has happened, not just in auto manufacturing, but in other areas of manufacturing is continued improvement in quality control, inventory control, and the use of, uh, of machines. And, and you know, I'll use the word robots because sometimes they actually are robots to do some of the repetitive work. At the same time, we have highly skilled laborers that work in the, uh, in the plants and the design, and I'm using laborers in the way you are here. Anybody that works is a laborer. Uh, so you and I are laborers right now. And that has in turn resulted in very high wages and benefits for a lot of the workers, including a, lot, a number of the workers that are going on strike and a very high value added industry. So today the auto industry is actually producing fewer vehicles. Uh, it's now selling about 14 to 15 million vehicles, not 15 or 16 or even 17. Mm -hmm. uh, we make them in not only in Michigan, Ohio and Indiana and, and Texas, but we make them in Georgia. We make them in Alabama. Uh, we make them in South Carolina. There are other states here, uh, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, Indiana. So there's a lot of activity. It's a great industry to have. High value added and workers are not expendable. Love, well, out of fairness, let me ask what is essentially the opposite of question about labor shortages. Yeah. Have labor shortage, shortages plagued the auto sector? And are, are demographics going to take uh, shortages and make them worse and accelerate the shortages over time? There have been labor shortages for a lot of manufacturers and people in the industry. Uh, and some of that is demographics. And some of that also is just bad economic policy. Uh, and you saw that particularly during the extreme policies that were undertaken during the, the pandemic, where we, among other things, actually paid people more to not work than to work with just corrosive effects on people being in the, in the labor force. And you can just look at a line of labor force participation, particularly for men, up to the point of the pandemic and then it drops uh, and it's it's really it's it's a much bigger problem than just the auto industry or manufacturing this is a is a societal problem for the united states of america where we have through largely through government policies discouraged people from working and it's you can see it particularly among prime age men and that's a problem way outside manufacturing let me ask you about auto demand and and specifically what uh what i have in mind is you hear once in a while that there's fewer drivers fewer people are driving even even younger people millennials and younger are um interested more in walkability so uh what's happening to labor demand and is it uh to um auto demand and is it um weakening due to less driving you are right that there's a little bit, there's a change in the culture as there always is. And the focus on cars is missing from a lot of the, the culture. I mean, I, I can think of kind of like Bruce Springsteen albums where every, every other one involved a car and racing in New Jersey. And then, you know, some, some, some bad breakup or, or like, let's, you know, but meanwhile, let's head off to the beach and I don't know, born to run. Uh, so there, there was a lot of that. And uh, of course, we even had rock uh, rock group called The Cars, right? <laughs> and the Beach Boys saying about uh, about this. And you don't see the same focus on it. And of course, we have you know, people spend money on iPhones and fancy, fancy tech gadgets and things like that in, in, in an amount that's just unfathomable. However, it's not true that people aren't driving. Actually, vehicle miles traveled continues to go up. Uh, and some of that is business driving and delivery services, which have hugely increased. Now, a lot of the, the tech economy actually involves more driving, not less driving. Uh, and I, for that reason, we still need a 
passenger vehicles and business vehicles. I will say that I think that the, the peak auto demand years of 16 and 17 million units are behind us. And our the Anderson Economic Group forecast that we've done recently involve a trend grow uh, sales rate of more like 15 or even 14. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's an, a big adjustment. A lot of that has to do with the plain fact that the cars are better. They last longer, they're safer, they have lower emissions. So, uh, and th these are the ICE cars, the traditional internal combustion engine cars and the hybrid cars. They're just plain better than they used to be. They're also costing a lot more, but as a result, you see people keeping them longer and they don't need to buy new ones as often. Okay, uh, by the way, I grew up in New Jersey, so, uh... We can do a show in Springsteen <laughs> yeah. sometime. Yeah. Obviously, wages are a big part of, of this story and are, are just motivating a lot of the picket line. So let me ask you a question. I mean, obviously, the, the pandemic year has distorted everything, distorted all uh, critical variables. So I'm going to ask about the past decade. Let's 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 get down to it. What has happened to the path of wage growth for, growth for auto production workers over, let's say, the past decade? You know, wages have grown, have grown across manufacturing and across the country. And uh, in fact, wages for auto workers have also grown. So have benefits. Uh, in the last few years, the profit sharing payments have been very healthy for union auto, unionized auto workers, often $10,000 a year in addition. Uh, it's important to know that the actual cash compensation of a lot of the UAW workers ranges between 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120, 130 thousand dollars a year plus benefits. So the claim of poverty wages is unfortunately not, I should say fortunately, not correct. It's unfortunate that that this kind of statement was made. It's not an, an honest statement. That doesn't mean that these workers and other workers don't deserve wage increases. And in fact, if you look at the Anderson Economic Group work before the strike happened, we said these workers didn't cause inflation. They're not responsible. They're not, they didn't do the outrageous federal government spending. They didn't do the Fed policy. Uh, they have every right to ask for a big wage increase. And in general, a, a, a fairly major wage increase is what I would expect from for workers that are working for profitable companies where they have a contract that goes on for a certain amount of time and they're up for renewal after a, a string of inflationary years. So I fully expect that uh, UAW workers are going to get a wage increase. I think they deserve a wage increase. And uh, we said that before the strike began. Every once in a while, somebody sounds the death bell for unions. So, and as Mark Twain would, uh, say, you know, uh, would paraphrase, yeah. it's been premature. Yeah. Um, what has happened to union membership in, in the auto sector? Uh, is it growing, stagnant, declining? What, what's happening to it? In general, unionized employment uh, in the private sector, unionized employment has been going down. And that includes in the, in the auto industry. That's a lot of that has to do with the fact that auto employment has gone down over over the last decades. Of course, we had a decade ago bankruptcies of General Motors and Chrysler, uh, and a lot of those plants related to that are closed permanently and gone. So we had a, some big employers that that disappeared. Uh, it is in terms of union employment, the public sector unions are are where that has been growing, and that's. You know, a pretty important topic when you look at whether it's healthy to have so many government employees represented by unions when they also have civil service often, but that's outside of the topic we're going to talk about today. You mentioned inflation and, and we're very challenged by it, so I, I would be remiss to not ask a, an inflation related question. If the um, the UAW gets its wage and benefit demands, um, that they're striking over now. What's going to happen to the price of cars, the, the U.S. price of cars? Well, let's look at the, the, the wage and the other demands to the extent we understand what they are. And, and noting, of course, that there's public rhetoric about this. There's also posted demands 
And then there is a very complicated contract provisions that beyond what we can we can do here and in some cases that I don't know and we are being negotiated right now in, in secret. In terms of the wage demands. I think the UAW workers are going to get a 20% wage increase. In fact, I think they get a 20% wage increase in the first two years of a very substantial wage increase. I also think there'll be cost of living adjustments and other things. And as everybody listening knows, the cost of health care continues to go up. There hasn't been any slowdown because of Obamacare or anything that the price of health care continues to go up. And Right now, the automakers bear the large majority of that. So there will be significant wage increases. There'll be significant benefit cost increases, and there'll be one or two additional days off as well, in addition to the significant number of holiday or family days that are already in these contracts. That's already been agreed to by the manufacturers. That is going to happen in any likely settlement. The sticking points here are, do you go from 20% to 30% or 35% or where President Biden just blurted out on the picket line, 40%? That's a pretty big sticking point. It is. And also, are we gonna have things that we're asked for? I don't know how seriously, and I've even heard, you know, let me say union representatives or people associated with the union say, well, maybe we won't get that, things like, a 32 hour work week would get paid for 40 uh, or the return to what was called the jobs bank, uh, which is a notorious uh, device that was created, I think, in the 80s. And, and one of the things that led to the bankruptcy of GM and Chrysler, those are also in the demands. And I don't see a way for that to happen. It's hard to have a conversation without about autos and not talk about global competition. In fact, you know, several reckoning books, David Halberstam's book uh, uh, of a, a number of years ago on, on the reckoning in the auto industry. So let, let's focus that on, on unions. Do key competitor countries for the, U, the U.S. auto industry, key competitor countries, do they have the same un, union pressures, generally speaking, that uh, are it, as are in the United States? Every country is different, and I'm sitting here in Michigan, so actually south of where we are now is Canada, portions of Canada, Windsor. So if you're in Detroit, you are north of Canada, and if you sing those journey songs about the boy that grew up in South Detroit, you are talking about Windsor, Canada. You are not talking about the Jersey Shore or whatever the Bruce Springsteen fans are singing <laughs> about. So uh, we have Canadian auto workers now we unifor a different a different. Uh, Union, they historically have, have approached things differently. And, and this session is a, is a repeat of that, where they've already got an agreement that's been ratified with Ford. So they've taken a much more business-like approach than, than uh, the United Auto Workers. I will say it's, it's not a situation, for example, that we have uh, a big cost difference with, say, Germany or some of the European buildings. The real serious cost questions are the following. Can GM and Chrysler compete with other manufacturers who are manufacturing in the United States? I'm talking about companies like Tesla, like Honda, like Toyota, like Kia, like Hyundai, and even Mercedes-Benz and BMW, and potentially uh, a growth through some of the joint ventures of uh, manufacturers from China or from South Korea. And then we have VinFast coming from Vietnam. So yes, there's what people would call foreign competition, but the, the most immediate competition that's faced by GM and Chrysler is actually from other manufacturers within the United States. Final question for Patrick Anderson the move to electric vehicles. What is the uh, gradual and, and but uh, inevitable move to electric vehicles going to do to the auto workforce? Is it gonna be a major disruptor? The sleeper issues, the wild card, the underlying tension in, in this particular negotiating is the heavily subsidized government pressured transition to electric vehicles. 
Uh, and this is something, again, Anderson Economic Group identified this before the strike. And there's an interesting thing, Cliff, if you look at the Detroit News, which is a, a great paper. It's a local paper in Detroit, but basically almost everybody involved in the auto industry is reading this. Uh, there on one day on May 9th, 2023, there's an editorial from me and an editorial from Sean Fain of the UAW, same day. By coincidence, we did not, by the way, we didn't discuss this and send us in our drafts back and forth. And my, I was laying out what was in front of us. And one of the things I cited was we have a serious issue about electric vehicles. And in particular, we have huge federal government subsidies to build the plants. Then we have subsidies for people who buy the, the, the cars. And then we have subsidies for the chargers. We're subsidizing each step. And at the same time, the automakers are losing money on every one they sell. And how, how are you going to do that when you actually have fewer, fewer North American workers for that? I raised that issue the same day Sean Fain raises the same issue. I will say he did a little more bombastically than I did, Clef, but you know, he's, he's a union president. He was organizing. And you can see that this is something that they have raised. It is a serious issue out there. Uh, you use the word inevitable. I'd encourage your listeners, go on, the, uh, go on the Anderson Economic Group website, look at our auto dashboard and see that line of BEV penetration and notice that it's still under 7%. I'd say it, it is growing and growing from 2% to seven is a big growth. And in fact, my battery electric vehicles out in that parking lot. So I actually drive one myself, but I wouldn't be so bold or arrogant as to suggest that everybody has to or will be driving an EV by the end of this decade. Patrick Anderson, you gave us your time. You gave us your expertise. Thank you very much for joining us today. Cliff, nice to talk with you. Thank you. Uh, viewers, next for our next episode, we're going to be tackling climate change. Very interesting follow-on to, to today's discussion. Until then, we'll see you at the next episode.